people experiencing homelessness actually take really great care of their animals because they're so highly bonded and prioritize that care over even their own needs. I've got offers. People have tried to give me thousands and thousands of dollars for them before I'm buying them. I'm like, hey, if I ever had pups, you know, it'd be one thing, but they're like, you need money, I'll give you $10,000. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's not the money. Well, at some level, homeless people's relationships with their dogs are just like anyone else's. They love their animals just like we love their animals. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today on the show, we talk about the difficult topic of homeless people and their dogs. What makes people take on the responsibility of caring for an animal on the streets and the loving bond that forms between the two? So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey Pepper, want to go for a walk? So when we walk down the streets in a major city or even a small town, they are there. But some people, they say, don't notice them unless they have a dog with them. Yeah, and I have to say, if they do have a dog with them, there is always a slight concern. Is the dog getting enough care and the right kind of care? Our show today is all about those lovable canines that found their forever homes on the streets. It's estimated that as many as 70 million dogs and cats are homeless in the US and anywhere from 200 to 600 million worldwide. We'll be going into what it means to be homeless with a dog and how for some, they chose to stay homeless rather than be separated from their companions. At the end of the day, it is like being separated from a family member. Mm, Exactly. In 2006, I was in New York visiting on a vacation, and I saw a homeless man with his dog. That's Genevieve Frederick from Feeding Pets of the Homeless. Like other people, homeless in the past had always been invisible to me, like they are to most people. But the dog is what grabbed my attention. He wasn't panhandling. He was just resting on the sidewalk with his dog. We pause here, Jim. Panhandling, it's something I'm familiar with when I lived in Canada, but it's not a word that most Brits will have heard. Oh, well, it is asking for money on the street. I think traditionally it comes from the old thing of you had a little pie pan and as people walk by, they throw their coins into it. It would make a noise. But uh, it's basically anyone who's, who's looking for a few extra bucks to help them get through their day. Here's Genevieve again. I couldn't get this unwrapped in my brain how he was taking care of this dog when he couldn't take care of himself. Not knowing a lot about homeless or anything about this, but this vision that I had taken back with me to Carson City, Nevada, where our headquarters are. Genevieve instantly got to work on creating her organization to help the homeless and their dogs. And all because she saw a dog on the streets and wondered, is there something I can do to help? It's always amazing to me how much of an effect a dog can have on us when it comes to all sorts of things, including charitable efforts. And how much one person's decision can make, because that's all it takes. And that's the theme of many things that we're talking about recently on Dog Edition. You and your love for dogs can make a pivotal difference in so many lives. Here's Genevieve. I went to my veterinary hospital and my friend who is a doctor there and I asked if we could put a donation site in his reception area and have his clients bring pet food and then we would take it over to a local food bank where it would be distributed to homeless in my community. That 55 gallon garbage can was over full with pet food. It was taken directly to the food bank. Since that time, the donation sites have collected over 875 tons of pet food. We put a fair market value on that pet food when it's reported to us, and it's $3.6 million. 875 tons of pet food. 
valued at over $3.6 million. That is incredible, all from that one experience that Genevieve had. So we know that through that organization, they're getting the food okay, but what happens to dogs on the street? Do they get the veterinary care that they need? Yeah, I've always wondered that myself. Here is Christine Kim to shed some light on that. So this is really a huge reason why we got started in the space of storytelling to begin with. Christine Kim started My Dog is My Home. It's a project that began with firsthand stories of those on the streets with dogs. As her organization grew, she started to discover the big question was, who should have a dog? We were butting up against this issue all the time in the animal community. Who's an appropriate or worthy caregiver for an animal? Who has the right to have a companion animal in their life? Today, unfortunately, the prevailing thought was that people who are of a certain income bracket, people who don't have a physical home, and people who come from certain communities or have certain skin color really have no business having an animal because there's just a lot of implicit bias in the community. Christine tells us that there are biases that always come up, like where should a dog go? When you go to a shelter, how do they determine which home is an appropriate home to go to and what happens once the dog gets there? Are you able to care for the animal? Here's Christine. I think what's missing from that picture is that you know, people experiencing homelessness, although they may not actually have a physical home, really love their animals and are extremely bonded to them. There has been a lot of research in this area that actually quantifies like the human animal bond and the intensity that people are bonded to their animals. And in those research studies, what was found is that people experiencing homelessness are actually more highly bonded to their animals than people who are housed. We reached out to two people who have spent time researching the human-animal companion bond. The first was Jenny Stavsky. She worked with Louise Scanlon on a study in 2020. The first thing we did was a questionnaire of homelessness organisations to find out about their pet policies and their reasons why they did or didn't accept pets. Then Louise went out and recruited homeless pet owners and asked them about their pet and they lied. And that was published as one study. And if you're interested in reading that study, well, we have a link to that in today's show notes. I wasn't that surprised by the study. But I think one of the things that people are surprised by is how well cared for homeless people's pets are. I think people can be very judgmental and say, well, if you can't look after yourself, if you don't have a home yourself, you shouldn't have a pet. And that's very easy to say. But actually, the pets were really, really well cared for. In some respects, they had fewer welfare problems than many conventionally housed pets. They were really very healthy, happy dogs by and large. We went to the streets of New York City and met a gentleman by the name of David. You heard from him at the top of the show. He's homeless and he has two adorable deaf pit bull dogs. He talks a little bit about how healthy he thinks his dogs are. That's Athena and Mrs. Aspen. They're a little overweight because I spoil shit and push them around in a chariot. <laughs> His chariot is a sort of makeshift cart with a bike attached to the side and a blue and yellow umbrella on top. It sounds very cool, doesn't it? One of the dogs sits under the tabletop while he talks and the other snuggled up next to David. We asked David if his dogs receive veterinary care. Oh well, yeah, you know, people always, you know, there's always options. Yeah, they've had everything they need. It was obvious to us how deeply David loved his dogs and how much they meant to him. This next part, he tells us, as he pours a bottle of water, we gave him straight into the dog's bowl for them. They get everything they need. They they come first, you know. I've had offers. People try to give me thousands and thousands of dollars for them before I'm buying them. If I ever had pups, it would be one thing. But they're like, you need money, I'll give you $10,000. I'm like, I don't care. (laughs) It's not the money. The second researcher that we spoke with is Leslie Irvine. She's a professor of sociology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Leslie has written many books on the subject of animal-human bonds, but she wrote a book called My Dog Always Eats First, Homeless People and Their Animals. Here's Leslie. Well, at some level, homeless people's relationships with their dogs are, you know, just like anyone else's. They love their animals just like we love their animals. but. When you are homeless, when you don't have the, 
I guess the word would be accoutrement of everyday life that those of us enjoy who have houses, have cars, have, you know, bookshelves and closets full of clothes and things that we can show to the world to illustrate that we're responsible or respectable, you know, for them, the dog becomes that primary evidence they have that not only, you know, they have a structure in their life, they can make a commitment and that some other being cares about them, no matter if they have, you know, not showered in weeks, if they have no teeth, no matter what their history is, this other being thinks that they're the greatest thing in the world. As Jim mentioned, Leslie spent time researching the topic of homelessness and their pets, and she interviewed countless homeless people in Colorado, and she shared with us some of the stories of those people she spoke to. I think of all the stories, Donna's story with Athena, that particular redemption story is one that stood out to me. She began smoking crack as a teenager, and she then started using heroin and then started traveling with the boyfriend. And by the time she was 20 years old, she was a truck stop prostitute. And she also became HIV positive. And through a connection with a formerly homeless woman in San Francisco, she connected Donna with this German shepherd named Athena. And the woman, Paley, who rescued the dog, just thought that this was the right dog for Donna. As dog lovers know, when you find that pooch, that heart dog that is meant to be yours, you just know it right away. And it's also amazing how sometimes the right dog comes along at the right time. We may not know that we need them, but somehow the dog always finds us. And she said, you know, Athena can be your dog, but you have to make some choices. And she had to make a decision. At one point, she gave up cold turkey. She gave up heroin and alcohol. And I have heard stories of how bad that withdrawal can be, but she just she just gave it up for this dog and went on to draw on the dog's love to sustain her through a recovery. And when I talked to her, Athena had died, but she had another dog that the same woman had connected her with. And she was about to start HIV treatment at the same time. And she said, I want to live. I want to live for this dog. And the veterinarians at the street clinic had cremated Athena after she died. And the plan was that they were saving her ashes. So when Donna died, their ashes were going to be scattered together. And that's a very, very powerful love there. And it changed two lives, a dog's life and a person's life. Wow. I'll never get over the love that can be brought about by one of our dogs. And that's a pretty special thing as well, the idea of saving the dog's ashes so that they can be scattered together eventually. That's very powerful. The subject of dogs being loved deeply by their homeless owners came up over and over again during the interviews that we conducted for this episode. Here's Genevieve. I think the biggest thing that I have learned that that human-animal bond is very, very strong. The other thing that I think is most important for me that I have learned is the average length of someone living once they become homeless is cut almost in half. And when they have a dog, they're not going to go to a hospital. They're not going to get the treatment that they need until an ambulance pulls up. And then, unfortunately, then animal control gets involved. They take that animal and take it to the local shelter. And the person goes to the hospital. And then they never see that animal again. And they're heartbroken. That causes them to go into a deeper depression because they lost the only living thing that they had. Oh, that's terrible for both the human and the pet. So people won't get the help they need because they can't leave their pets. And after hearing about that, I completely understand that. So these folks just had a really hard time getting into this housing program that was set up specifically for people like them. And 
you know, at that point, I was just like, what is happening? What are we doing? Why is this happening? And why is this program that was set up specifically to help people navigate these challenges and remove barriers to housing still making it so difficult in this event where somebody has a companion animal that's helping them cope with all kinds of things? Um, the experience of being homelessness is already a trauma in and of itself. And so taking away their companion animal is, is sort of furthering that traumatic experience. It's incredible, really, if you think about it. We recognize that dogs can help with emotional support, but somehow if that support is provided to them on the streets, we kind of blank out all that information or certain people do at least. And you think that they're not as valuable to people on the street, but I think we're learning they they really are. Christine started her organisation after working as a social worker on Skid Row in LA and joined to tell stories with the National Museum of Animals in Society. It was mostly an online museum that did pop-up exhibitions, temporary exhibits. And then it also had this wonderful blog that explored different topics on human-animal bond. And so it evolved into its own exhibit. And it became the museum's first actual brick-and-mortar exhibit in a gallery space in East Hollywood. And that exhibit was designed to give or provide a platform for people with lived experience, that lived experience of being homeless with a companion animal. Christine eventually went on to create My Dog Is My Home. And so we incorporated into a nonprofit organization and we decided that, you know, we really want to maintain the storytelling element. And we think that's actually what drives change. We think that research is hugely valuable. And so we maintained that we needed to work with the programs to really make that change. And so our nonprofit now exists to work with the existing homeless services system and push them to transform their programs and their spaces so that they are fully accessible to people with animals. It's nice to know that people like Genevieve and Christine are out there and they're doing this kind of work that will change not just the human's life, but the life of the dogs. We started getting phone calls from some of our donation sites that there was a dog here that needs treatment. Because this is a homeless person, can we get this dog to a vet? And I said, you know what? Let's start this whole program. And at the time, no one was talking about, you know, I'm talking 2008. No one was even discussing homeless and their pets. So as money was coming in, now I was able to start the next program, which is emergency veterinary care. And this veterinary care is huge. Yeah, and their budget must be too. We all know how much it can cost to take our beloved dogs to the vet when they get sick or injured. So how can someone living on the streets really be expected to give their dogs that same level of care? Organizations like Feeding Pets for the Homeless that gave out this veterinary care have saved countless dogs' lives, and in return, they've helped to save the lives of the people who love those dogs. Jenny, the clinical researcher we heard from earlier, is based in Nottingham in England, proving that this love is worldwide. It's really helpful to remember is that this is a one health issue, that this is not just about the health of the animal, it's not just about the health of the person, they're so entwined with each other, and it's really almost impossible to help one without the other. But the people who were interviewed by us told us their stories about how they've been told to give up their dog and then they could have housing, told that, you know, just let it run free. And the dog wouldn't pick it up. It won't be your problem anymore. And they're like, well, how can I do that? I was my best friend. That's the only person I want to be with. So they would choose to sleep with her. So it's almost like the dog is keeping them homeless. We just don't have enough people talking about this topic and trying to sort out this problem. Exactly. And even when they are, they seem to just be scratching at the surface. Christine tells us how these shelters and services are already stretched really thin, and they already have a hard time meeting the human need. So adding animals to the mix is, well, it makes things a little bit more complicated. Christine tells us that many shelters don't accept pets into them. And then this in turn leaves the person with a choice of accommodation or giving up their canine companion. I certainly feel for systems that are struggling to grapple with this idea of of allowing animals into the shelter facilities or to, to housing programs. But it is totally a worthwhile thing to grapple with, especially if housing and human services providers and shelter providers 
are seriously talking about trauma-informed care and person-centered care. If that's the case, if those are real things that they hold as values, then they really need to take into account the human-animal bond as an important element in people's lives. Because these are not just pets, they're family members. And to ask people to leave their family members to access these other services is traumatizing for people. Some of these services are, of course, really simple for those of us who have homes, you know, making a doctor's appointment or going to the grocery store. So if you do have a home, it's straightforward. You just leave your dog safe at home and hope they don't eat everything in the kitchen. But where do you leave your dog when the streets you are home? You're really asking people to leave an important part of their lives behind. And and oftentimes they won't. They're just not willing to do that. And so if we want a healthier system, if we want to really address the need in a way that is trauma-informed, then this is something that needs to be brought to the forefront. We're going to take a break, but we will be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff, traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpup. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. We all love our dogs, but those lucky enough to have a home for their pets can't understand what a dog might mean to those who are on the streets. A homeless person can choose to have a dog for lots of reasons. Protection is one of the big ones that we all think about. And for a woman, that can be a really big necessity. We know about over the last 12 months that 62% of the people that we have helped are homeless women. People don't associate women being homeless not very often because it's so dangerous on the streets. They stay in the shadows. And so that dog is their protection, and it doesn't matter how big that dog is. A little chihuahua can alert that woman that something or someone is getting too close. So that's why a lot of women do have dogs as protection. Not only that loyalty and that companionship, that unconditional love, and these animals are non-judgmental. They don't judge them because they don't have a house or a roof. As we've said through this episode, dogs are a source of love. They are companions who stay with their owners 24-7. One of the things I do notice, Jim, when you see homeless people on the streets is often the dogs are not on leashes and they're just following the homeless people. They know that they belong together and there's no reason for a flexi leash or anything because they stay awfully close. Most of those dogs are awfully good at at staying, you know, loyal and close right with with their person. And I I guess one of the things that um, homeless dogs don't ever need to worry about is getting exercise, because I'm guessing they spend an awful lot of time walking around all the time. Well, yeah, they're actually kind of healthy because they're getting that exercise. A lot of times people wonder, when I see a dog on the streets, should I... Should I feel bad for those dogs? You don't actually need to feel sorry for the animal. Most of the time, that animal is so happy, (laughs) right? They get to spend all their time with their human that loves them. We 
have our animals at our homes and we see them when we're at home. But people, again, who are experiencing homelessness are just so highly bonded to them and also spend almost 24-7 with them. And so I think when people feel sorry for the animals, you don't actually need to feel sorry for the animals. I think what what the appropriate reaction should be is really more concern over what the person isn't getting because they're so committed and sacrifice a lot to maintain that relationship. Something that is really cool that Genevieve is doing with Feeding Pets for the Homeless is they are giving the homeless people and the shelters crates to put their dogs in when the person goes into the shelter. So the dog basically has a shelter within the shelter in the form of that crate. We will drop ship new metal collapsible crates to any homeless shelter that asks for some so that these animals and these pets can stay with their humans. We like to keep the dogs with their humans because they have a bond that is so strong. To separate them causes anxiety and undue stress for the animal as well as the human because they're used to being together 24-7. Speaking of Genevieve, can we go back to her veterinary program that she started? Yes, she tells us that they have a network of over 1,400 veterinary clinics around the United States. And they can call any one of those veterinary hospitals and get an appointment right away. And then they can make sure that the animal gets the treatment that they need, including vaccinations. All of that is fully paid for by donations. And if you think that sounds expensive, it is. But amazingly, her organization has raised and paid $700,000 in those veterinary hospital bills. That is a lot of money, and that veterinary care is very worthwhile. It makes a difference in terms of the lives of those pets and in terms of making sure that the animals are vaccinated. They're being treated for something else, but we always ask the doctor, update their vaccinations. We're, right now, we're seeing a lot of parvo cases because so many homeless who have pets, their animals are not vaccinated. So that brings me to another program that we started. We will pay for the hard costs of a doctor going out to where the homeless congregate to vaccinate and do a basic exam of these pets. If a pet needs, if it's ill and it needs treatment that he can't handle, you know, in the field, then it becomes one of our emergency cases. And then we get that animal to the nearest hospital. I love that image of a veterinarian just going out into the streets and finding these dogs and and giving them the care they need. So after all of this, after all these conversations we've had about this topic, we still wonder, is there a solution to the problem? The reality is, particularly with the economy, how it is around the world at the moment, we are always likely to have some homeless people. And so I guess the question is, is there anything that can be done to make sure that the services that are on offer for them also include their animals? Well, Jenny had a few thoughts on that very subject. Well, I think we can look at proximal solutions, which is providing more pet-friendly accommodation, education seems a one health problem, but ultimately You know, we're living in a world where the gap between the rich and poor is greater and greater. The economic crisis is building and brewing. We can keep patching people up with band-aids, but until there's a recognition that everyone's human right is to have a safe living space and enough money to eat and heat in their home, which we're a long way from, I don't think we'll ever be beyond homelessness. It's the distribution of resources that's a problem. But beyond like overhaul and change of government, just talking about it more and getting people to exchange ideas. Not all hostels will ever be pet friendly. There's always needs to be a space for people who don't want to be around animals. But there is existing research that suggests that for many people in, so, you know, I think it's just that openness and that understanding that impact on people's health of caring for their pets makes it worth doing. I couldn't agree more. I think clearly this is a problem that is going to persist, but there are things that we on an individual level can do, and we've seen some of that today. This episode also makes me think of something that somebody said to me when I was living in Ottawa, which is that everybody deserves the basic rights. And I think when you look at these dogs on the streets, I think all dogs are deserving as well. We have to ensure that they get the proper care and they get to be accommodated with their owners and their owners are looked after as well. And that's something that we as a society need to petition for. So yeah, a lot to think about. I'm with you. To get the last word in, here is Leslie. I 
would say it's important to meet people where they are. You might think they can't take care of their dog because they can't take care of themselves. But what it means to take care of oneself or a dog might have things going on with it that you don't understand at the moment. But they're living their life the way they want to. And if the dog looks healthy, and homeless people's dogs often have good body condition, they get fed, they're exercised regularly, they get to socialize with other dogs and other people then they might well be living a very good life for a dog. If you would like to help, because it really just takes one person to help, we have links in today's show notes and on their episode page on our website at dogedition.com. You'll find different organizations that are providing assistance to help homeless people and their dogs. And if you'd like to hear more stories about dog-related issues, then make sure you follow along to Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app. And we always say it, but let a friend know about the show, preferably a dog lover. That's what we like. I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. And I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. Thanks for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.